Before we begin, I want to tell you that when I hear from senior officials in the Palestinian Authority and I speak to them on almost a daily basis about the expected scenarios after Abu Mazen and the, uh, what will happen on the political stage, we have to keep in mind that we have already seen changes in command, changes in leadership in the PA after Arafat died mysteriously in 2004 and there were elections. Abu Mazen was elected and became head of the PA. And in the, P in the, in the Palestinian Authority, these senior officials that we talk to, Sheikh Mahmoud Al-Alul, Muhammad Ashtaya and others, they argue, they're very insistent in their arguments that this is the path that the PA will follow, will continue to follow after Abu Mazen, after he is no longer able to remain in power. And that means that there's a Palestinian law. According to the Palestinian law, when the chair person, chairman of the PA is unable to continue in his role or passes away, there is a 60 day period in which head of, in which a uh, in which there is a temporary appointment that is made for that is made for two for two months for sixty days, and uh, head of the parliament or the national uh, the Palestinian national council uh, appoints a temporary chairperson, and then elections are held, and another chairperson will be uh, another chair a new chairperson is elected, and the goal is for Al Fuchbi to be the temporary he leader until there are elections. Now, but from what I understand from them is that they are not willing, according to what they say, and they may be lying, they are not willing to be appointed temporarily without setting a date for elections, and they are not willing to neither Hussein al-Sheikh or Faraj are not willing to come in on his, what they call on Israeli tanks. And that puts Israel in a situation of elections and the international arena will also insist on elections and democratic elections. And then in, from the moment uh, Abu Mazen is no longer a leader, Israel will be in a situation of elections within two or three months in the Palestinian Authority. And that brings us to the scenarios that were mentioned before regarding the risk that Hamas will present a candidate and will win because we all know, according to the polls in the palace, on the Palestinian streets, that, the, that Hamas is the strong power in Judea and Samaria. And that will lead us to a situation in 2006 when the Hamas won the parliamentary elections. And that's something that has to be be taken into account. And that's one thing. Now to the topic of our discussion, the Palestinian Authority, despite the problems with Oslo and the criticism that we hear from all sides, the Palestinians and the Israelis and the mutual accusations of who caused the agreements to fail. The fact is that the PA is about on the verge of collapse, but it is still there. It has survived these 30 years of the since the Oslo agreement and the question is what do we do with what do we do next Prime Minister Netanyahu said about a month ago he said very clearly that we will not allow the PA to collapse the interest of the state of Israel is for the PA to continue to exist so that it can fight terror along with Israel and I think that Netanyahu said so very clearly and there is American backing for that and that is the goal of the Israeli the state of Israel. It is the, in the interest of the state of Israel to maintain the PA and make sure it continues to stay in control of the area, to continue to rule. And Netanyahu has said that he's not willing to give them a Palestinian state, but he's willing to give them extent, expanded autonomy. Netanyahu repeated what Rabin has said before. He is continuing Rabin's tr the path that Rabin began. So the question is, where do we go from here? Where do we go from this point on when we have a situation in which there may be elections very shortly after Abu Mazen is no longer pri the, the chairman? 
it could, according to Palestinian law, it's two months. If it takes a little bit longer to get organized, it could be three or four months, but it's not very long, and that may put us in a very problematic situation. So um, I think to answer your question, you have to go backwards, because I, I don't think Israel ever appreciated uh, the geopolitical impact of Oslo. I'm, I'm not just talking about the regional impact, the impact on Israel, but the geopolitical impact. Let me give you a, a quick example. In 2006, I was a senior official in the, in the White House. Uh, I worked for uh, Vice President Cheney, and the 2006 war broke out. There's been a thousand meetings and a thousand analyses of the 2006 war, but in not one meeting have I ever heard about the impact of the 2006 war on the geopolitical circumstances of the United States' view. It fundamentally changed the internal balance of power inside the United States government. Uh, Vice President Cheney lost altitude. Rumsfeld lost altitude because they gave Israel lots of room and prevailed over Condoleezza Rice. They gave lots of room to Israel to try to win the war because they saw it as a strategic regional event that needed to end in an Israeli victory, not a ceasefire. Condoleezza Rice argued, it's a flare-up, we need to calm it down. She did not see it as a strategic victory, but President Bush understood it was a strategic event, and as a result, President Bush sided with Cheney and with Rumsfeld and gave Israel the room. The problem is Israel didn't take up the issue, and the war dragged on, and the war dragged on, and the Condoleezza Rice behind the scenes started talking with Tzipi Livni and so forth, and they each began to hide behind each other. Israel, the Americans are, tra are forcing a ceasefire on us. The, Israeli, uh, 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 the Americans, the Israelis are trying to get out of this war. We need to help them. And all of a sudden, the, the, the balance of power inside the, the American government shifted. And Cheney and Rumsfeld lost credibility internally. And they never, ever recovered. Ever. Um, so these are the sorts of impacts Israeli behavior has internally on the United States that has great geostrategic impact. Now Oslo, and before I think one answers whether one should continue with the structure, try to make it work, what comes after, I think we have to take a look at that geostrategic framework for understanding what Oslo did. You have to go back to 19, really the 1960s, when the United States faced a ter terrible situation in Vietnam, was losing, the French had lost with the FLN in Algeria, Israel won the 67 war, and the United States had peaked out in terms of its nuclear forces. So three of the four major measures of the Cold War progress were going in the momentum toward the Soviet Union. The only one that wasn't was Israel. So the Soviets put tremendous effort. Israel became not just another strategic interest for the Russians. And this picks up, I think, a lot on what Isabella was saying and so forth. It became one of the most important ones. So they put everything into the conventional, first by helping with the war of attrition, even at the end, in August 1970, intervening directly and it didn't work, then the 73 war, and then the 73 war came, and that was a major strategic impact. Growing up in the United States at that time, the 73 war for us had a lot to do with Israel, but it had to do with Europe. Namely, the belief was that the defeat of the Israeli Air Force had made the advantage of the West in air power obsolete that the Russians had developed an answer to our strategic superiority in the air. On the ground, we knew that we were less. We had less tanks, Soviet tanks were seen to be better, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a genuine feeling in the West, we were losing altitude. In the Cold War, in the 73 war, exposed our vulnerability. That our ace in the hole, that the Air Force would dominate, was destroyed. 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting there. So at the end, what happened then was 1982 war came around. And I, again, in Israel, I don't think they understood the geostrategic impact of the war. Number one, the cause celeb, you know, the FLN was very popular, the non-aligned movement, Vietnam. So these liberation movements became a central Soviet strategic objective. And here was the cause celeb, the center of it, the organizer, the, the center of all activity was destroyed in 1982. It was moved a thousand miles away. It was humiliated. This was a tremendous blow to the Soviet Union. And second of all, in the process, almost as a second war, the great vaunted air defense system of the Russians was obliterated in the Bakaa Valley. Look, the bottom line is Israel saved. The, the, the whole progressive world then focused. Came 19... 1990, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the entire world of strategy of the radical progressive world was reduced to ashes. And came Israel in Oslo and salvaged the most important element of the progressive world. It almost gave a Noah's Ark to progressivism globally by granting it a major victory the only victory it had had following the 82 war. I mean, I wanted to get into the United States with, with, with Star Wars and so forth, shut down the nuclear as well under the Reagan era. So all of a sudden the Soviet Union was going backwards and in 1990 it collapsed, 91 it collapsed. So Oslo at the, vic at the very heart of it fundamentally granted the progressive world the ability to survive. To this day, so, so as long as the PLO continues to reign, that world, that world of progressivism will continue to thrive and will continue to grow. And I'm telling you, from the United States, it was marginal until 10 years ago. It is now a big threat in American politics. And the Palestinian issue is one of the biggest, and the Palestinian Authority is the vehicle through which it operates globally and strategically. The second thing is, is there a way you can salvage it? And this is, this is the final point. Uh, Einat Wilf this morning said, well, you know, the Israel never understood the Palestinian Authority or the PLO never reconciled with the question of 48. The reason is it couldn't. Its very essence was 1948. It wasn't an organization founded on the questions of 67. The very return of the PLO validated the questions of 1948 and devalidated Israel. Israel never understood it destroyed its own validity by turning to the PLO rather than a localized, result, localized um, um, resolution of the Palestinian issue. So it, it wasn't that it didn't want to deal with the, or didn't want to give up the questions of 48. It was who it was. And there was no way around it, and it still is. So in my view, the only way Israel can begin to strategically reverse the drift toward progressivism in the West, which is a strategic threat, as well as begin to fight back on suppressing the questions of, four, of 48 and return to the question of 67, which is what to do about the population that lives under Israel, Israeli control. I think the only way to do that is you have to trash the entire Oslo framework. You have to get rid of the PLO. Um, so what that takes, I'm not an Israeli, and I'm sorry, I know it will be a very painful process, but it's a process you're going to go through one day or another. We heard a very interesting, uh, very interesting approach about having to get rid of the PLO and the Palestinian Authority. The question is, what is the alternative, and how we can control uh, so many uh, millions of Palestinians from the civilian perspective? First and foremost, we will talk about your plan, and but the question is, how can we control three million civilians on a daily basis? I'm not only talking about the military perspective. Do you think that after Israel, as represented by the by the and the prime minister said that we have to maintain the PA, do you think that's even an, an a, a realistic alternative? I don't look at this from the geopolitical perspective. 
How do I change the PA? Who to me is a byproduct. I have interests and I know what my interests are. I go with what was created after 30 years of Oslo and Israel's interests following what has been created. Very few understand the way Tzhak Rabin saved the state of Israel from Oslo through the Oslo youth interpretation because they led to a situation where the entire area will be Palestinian but within it there will be Jewish communities that no one knows the future of. And they are isolated. And what did they do with Oslo Bet? Everything will be Israeli, Area C, and the Palestinians will be in the enclaves. And that's the kind of Rabin I would w like to preserve. It's important to see how that is. Oh, if you can please put up the slide. I will say it very simply. Rabin in Oslo 2 spoke about four principles. In this, Rabin is one who was inspired by Eagle alone. The four principles are one, the state of Israel will maintain a Jewish majority of 80% in order to be democratic and Jewish. And what he's doing with Oslo is expediting or accelerating these conditions. The second principle is Jerusalem's in Jerusalem will be Israel's capital united with Givat Ze'ev and Ma'la Dumim. The third principle, the Jordan Valley in its broadest interpretation. And the fourth, the Palestinian state. It will not be a state. It will be a, an entity that is less than a state. These are the principles. You see them up on the screen. This is October 5th. And this is taking going taking Baleen's Oslo back to the Zionist route. And this is what we have continued to date. And this is what Netanyahu has continued. Can I see the map of the of areas A, B, and C? What Rabin actually does in areas A, B, and C is he creates a kind of compromise. What does it mean? What's this compromise? What most people don't understand. I come from Mapai. And this is a Mapai kind of compromise. If we heard Dr. Inat Vilf say that in a dilemma between sovereignty and land, the secular Zionism decided, decided sovereignty, this is not what Mapai was about. This is from a secular perspective. Not everyone who drives on Saturday is secular. A Mapai compromise is a Kabbalistic notion and it is the high road. It wants both. What Rabin is de doing with Oslo is on the one hand not no longer having Israeli control of the Palestinians, which is why he is giving them territory and a sovereign system. And also they want he wants Israel to hold on to those areas that are important to it from a security perspective and from its affiliation to the line of the Bible. And the difference between Inat Vilf and her is that this is decisiveness. This is the difference. That's why Ben Gurion didn't want a constitution because it requires decision. But Pine they don't make a decision. What's for today is today and what's tomorrow is tomorrow. We're not Western. We live with attentions. I want to give the Palestinians a sovereign entity, but one that does not endanger me on all aspects electromagnetic spectrum, airspace. And therefore, it will be less than a state. And this principle of Rabin, we must continue. Well, that, what that means is that all area C territories under today's conditions will have to be in Israel's hands and very strongly. All the Jewish communities should be in Israel's hands. Here, we should take 
three million Jews into that area because there's too much on the coast. And of course, Jerusalem has to develop eastwards and not westwards because if Jerusalem, according to the 2040 plan, is supposed to grow by 300,000 residential units, there is no room westwards. You'll reach Tel Aviv. It needs to be east, eastwards towards Mishor Adumim and the Dead Sea. And that changes the entire map of Israel which is like a ship where everyone is on one side so it'll topple, we need to ecologically balance it. And then we will be able to control areas where the Palestinians also have control. And the bottom line is that all those talk about separation from Yair Golan to Ehud Barak to uh, Turan Ben Barak. Please show me the Annapolis map. What they're actually saying is, how will you control so many Palestinians? What are you going to do? Well, you're denying the great achievement made by Rabin. In May 1994, IDF forces left all the Palestinian concentration population in. And in May 1994... Not in a disengagement. In today in Samaria, January 1996, this is the Annapolis map. I'll soon talk about that. In January 1996, all the Palestinians from areas B were moved to the Palestinian Authority, meaning the whole question of controlling Palestinians in Jerusalem, it's area C. That's not a problem. And in that respect, whether it'll be this kind of PA or that kind of PA, whether it'll be whether it'll be like Emirati, whether it'll be the Abu Mazen version, may he live forever, I don't care. The what's important is that they will be separate from us and they will be flexible. Tomorrow it's a new day, it'll organize itself differently, but that's the main idea. And I want to end by saying that this is the map that Olmert w go, went to Annapolis with. And to, and to a large extent, it's also Benny Gantz's map when he talks about 3% of Jewish communities being re remaining in our hands, which means turning your back to what Rabin was on about and everything we did not have in, K in Camp David or in Taba. Going back from maintaining the Jordan Valley, which is essential, he gave up on the Jordan Valley, going back on a state that is not a complete state, he gave them complete sovereignty. And another thing he did, which Rabin never thought of, which is an exchange of land, which is means leaving Gush Etzion instead of Arad, giving land of Nirim, Kisufim, Tiratzvi. That is illogical. We do not have land to give. Rabbi never thought of that. That is the Clinton outline, and we must remove the Clinton outline. And how do we remove the Clinton outline? With the Rabin outline. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you, We just heard P Professor Kedah's comment and he reminded me of his plan, the, the Emirati plan, Emirate plan. So if you, do you, you think if the PA will collapse, or if there'll be issues, it will be, it'll be difficult to find a successor for um, Abu Mazen f or f maybe for fear that Hamas will take over. Do you think that this plan, the Emirate plan proposed by Professor Kedah can be implemented? Not directly. I just think that as long as there is a version of the current state of affairs, this Israel's strategic uh, condition will decline because Israel's legitimacy will decline. Second thing is the progressive world will take momentum from it. It will strengthen it, them. So to get to Moti's plan, and look, I'm not an Israeli. I will not pay a price for that. But to me, PLO's collapse or the PA's collapse seems to me something that is not just inevitable, but also something that ultimately will be positive because it will pave the way for other forms of solution that are more local, that bring back the question to 1967 instead of 1948. 
But as long as the PLO is sitting there in these territories, you have discussed 1948 issues. And in this playing field, Israel cannot win. Just one simple comment. Anyone who studies the war in Ukraine, and I am learning it well, understands that if in 67, 68, 69, it would have been possible, I think it was not possible, but we would maybe have thought of returning to the 67 lines under the current threats. If Israel leaves the Jordan Valley, leaves the controlling territories that it is in control of in area B and C in Judea and Samaria, it is not it does not have any defense. It's not just defending borders, it is just simple suicide. What about Dr. Kedar's plan? If you know the area well, this has some feasibility. However, first of all, we need to know what we want for ourselves in our territory. I must develop uh, hold in Jerusalem, which is threatened by the Americans now. I have to develop a hold on Area C and to say we are here to stay. And to begin with, you might look at the solutions. I'd like to ask you a different question. He goes to Saudi Arabia to meet with the with Ben Salman about the about this agreement that Biden, the Biden regime wants to wants to initiate with the Palestinians and we with them and the Palestinians and we heard a lot of play down of the Israeli media and also the American media and all the reports about these negotiations between the United States and Saudi Arabia they all say that we can accept the Palestinian demands it's not a problem it's not a big deal and now I hear from the Palestinians that this delegation is going to demand of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman several very fundamental things. First of all, they want an Israeli obligation with, with courses of action and timetables for establishing a Palestinian state with Eastern Jerusalem as its capital, freezing the settlements, and they're also demanding transferring territories from from B, from areas B and C and make, transforming them into area A. So we are seeing that there are Palestinian demands that at least in this um, composition of the, the and with this coalition will be very difficult to meet their demands and it may create a political problem for Netanyahu. And that is exactly the question. I didn't say that they would accept it, but the question is considering the different approaches and the reports in the media and intelligence sources between King Salman and the Crown Prince Ben Salman. In your opinion, will Saudi Arabia adopt these Palestinian demands or will they have to take them off the ladder? It doesn't even have much to do with Israel. It's the fact that the Saudis have never forgiven Biden for what Biden did at the beginning of Biden's administration. He tried to, the crown prince feels that Biden tried to kill him and he will not forgive him for that. And he will, he humiliated him and they do not want to give him a victory in front of the next elections, a South Lawn ceremony, the crown jewel of peace processes. So the perfect Arab way to say no is you put conditions, you know, the other side can't agree to. So I think all this Palestinian issue that the Saudis put forward is a way for them to just push this beyond 2000. Hoping that there would be a Republican president. Hoping, and if not, they'll wait longer or they'll go for normal. For them, what's important isn't the formal peace. It's the under the table strategic cooperation. And that they get directly from Israel. And they actually don't want the United States involved because the United States keeps trying to re-involve the Palestinians. And, and they don't want that. So they keep pushing it away. And formally, they know that formally, the United States has, entered, has introduced this. They're happy to just let this sit for another two years until it's done. So I, I don't think, that's just my read of what they're really after. And by the way, the other thing about the Saudis is, why do they want peace with Israel? Why do they want strategic, it, it's the same reason the UAE. It's because they understood, and I think it goes back to 2015, 
they understood that Israel actually is a genuine independent regional power. And they stopped trusting the United States, so they had nowhere else they could turn. And they realized that Israel was more important to them as some sort of a strategic asset than, than even a formal peace. But more important to them than even the United States be, be, began to come. So for the Saudis, that's still the question, as long as Israel remembers that. But the more Israel gives in on peace, the more it acts weak in the eyes of the Palestinians and the PLO and is afraid of things like, for example, afraid of prisoners in the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, Betesal, afraid of them. I mean, the, Israel, the great Israeli army can't even reduce food portions to them without being afraid of some great calamity. This is weakness in their eye, and that actually reduces the desire not only of the Saudis, but eventually also of the UAE for peace. Before we hear the Gershon's opinion about Saudi Arabia, I want to remember that in 2019, the Iranians attacked the Saudi oil reserves in Bukik. That was in September. Trump was president at the time. The Americans did nothing. The Ramco facilities, what did they do? What did the Americans do against the Iranians? Nothing. I was there. I was involved. And that day, a decision, that was when a decision was made to, kill so, to assassinate Soleimani. There was, a decision was made to, to assassinate Qasem Soleimani as a result. So, let's hear what you have to say about the connection, relations between Saudi Arabia and, Palace, and the Palestinians, and if it's really just a game, if they're trying to buy, they're trying to buy time. This is a fascinating idea, but I think that there's something that we should all keep in mind and consider. The Chinese president visited Riyadh very recently, and he gave a very important speech, the American drive to try to change the Chinese involvement that is growing. This is what is pushing, putting pressure um, to try to reach an agreement and with the Saudi Arabians. And it seems that the Chinese have a stronghold in Iran, and so therefore the sanctions have not been especially effective because the Chinese have taken responsibility for the Iranian economy. They are there, and they are what are... They, are, they, were, they have the ability to stabilize the Middle East, including in the Iranian nuclear facilities, because they don't want any of these countries to be destroyed because they're invested in all of them. And there's a, we have a new system here that has to be considered. I want to move on to the Iranian issue and ask whether it can, has the ability to disrupt the Israeli strategy that we see and that was present, we presented different courses of action that Israel could take. Can the Iranians disrupt that? Do they have the ability to do so? I remember that uh, during, the two, during the past two years, I wrote m several documents for the Jerusalem Center about the terror groups that are, gr that are emerging, the, jihad, the Islamic Jihad cells, these all happened during, the, during uh, Bennett and Gantz while they were in power. The IDF did nothing about it until there was a significant wave of terror, and then they launched uh, an operation, and it wasn't enough, but it wasn't enough to stop the terror attacks. So now the Iranians have control over northern Samaria through these groups. The question is, do they have the ability to stop what Israel is planning, the different courses of action that Israel is planning, and will they enter Judea and Samaria even more intensively in the future? I see the Palestinian arena, arena as the main, uh, the main area in Judea and Samaria. It is the main arena for the fight wi against Iran. And if the state of Israel doesn't realize that it has to, over, has, to take, has to overcome the armed forces there, then it will lose control, just like in the security zone in Lebanon, and like what happened before 2006 and 2007. What, ha what is happening now in Judea and Samaria, especially in northern Samaria, is a shift. It's a strategic transition on four dimensions. The purpose, 
The purpose is to cause us to withdraw, just like we withdrew from the security zone and from the Gaza Strip, like the Americans withdrew from Afghanistan. Another goal is to, another issue is the, wep is the weaponization. The extent of weapons there changes the quality of the fighting there. There is a matter of organization. It's not just a handful of, of scattered armed, uh, armed individuals. There are groups that at the level, at the quality of Fatah at, and Global Jihad and Hamas, the, and the PA does not control them just like the Lebanese army doesn't control Hezbollah. And there's also the spirit, battle spirit. Their logic is that this is an opportunity. This is their, oppor their window of opportunity. And these four dimensions are things that Israel has to eradicate. So you accept the argument. I want to continue this point because it's a very important one. You accept the argument of the senior officers in, in uh, the IDF that you don't need another protective edge in Judea and Samaria. You have to deal with each, with each issue. Instead of having one long operation let, and cleaning out the entire area, as was done during Operation Protective Edge. That is the thing. Oh, uh, also remembers that because he was head of research at the time. You were in, in 2004, September 2004, we killed over 200 Hamas combatants in the Gaza Strip, and nothing changed. Nothing changed because killing a lot of people is not what causes the desired change. Israel has to go back, take, take control over Jenin, and not be afraid of, of putting a military regime there if the PA is unable to do so, and be able to address any, to reach any place where there is a threat, not only small pinpointing, uh, uh, you, so you are in favor of a larger scale operation, not something very specific. And if if it don't deal with this challenge, it will reach the point where we have the Gaza Strip in Judea and Samaria. We have to stop. So I'll give you each one minute to just make a closing comment. Please, no more than one minute. The, the, the Palestinian issue and the PLO are at the center of the revival of progressive thought, radical progressive thought in the world. Israel is both greatly threatened by that, but is also handed an opportunity because it gives Israel the opportunity to blow a hole in the center of the progressive drift of the world if it takes strategic initiative, but it can't be done by getting by with the Oslo framework. I agree. I think that we wouldn't have had protective edge without Ariel Sharon. I won't go into it now, but, but I don't think that the IDF can give that push uh, just as we wouldn't have had the, the wars in 48 and 49 without Ben Goyon. And I don't think that the Israeli government now has the ability to take responsibility for a strategic change. And we need a very significant strategic change because we're facing a new threat. Thank you very much. The sociological difference between Jenin on the one hand and all other Judea and Samaria Arab cities on the other is that in Jenin there is no role for the Hamulas, for the tribes. Why? Because of the build-up. But I want to go to the history. So your plan is only implementable for northern Samaria? It's a test. Why do other cities not in, uh, take part in the mess? Only a little bit in Nablus. Because there, the, the tribes, they want um, stability. So that is what we need to correspond with, because that is the only thing. Now, I have another half a minute. The Arab world, in general, is divided into two types of countries. Failed and successful. Failed is Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Sudan, etc. The successful ones are Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Kuwait. And what are the differences between them? These countries are modern. The failed ones are conglomerates of tribes, religious groups, ethnic groups, etc., versus the, Emir the Emirates that are homogeneous. One family, Al Maktoum is Dubai, and Al Hiyan is Abu Dhabi, and Al Sabah is Kuwait, and Al Thani 
is Qatar and Al Saud is Saudi Arabia. That's what works in the Middle East. Go to the families, go to the tribes, that's the only thing that works. Explain that to the Americans, they'll understand it. Right. Because in Gaza, if they're successful, because their army, for instance, every unit is, a, is one tribe that controls its own tribe locally. They know how to correspond with this sociological story. The entire concept of Oslo ignored it completely.